My name is Marco, Marco Hansen. And I'm Margaret Hansen, and we are related. We are closely related. <laughs> <laughs> um, we are legal translators, and I'm a court interpreter, and used to be a language access coordinator. And I was talking to Deanie Miller here in Mississippi last month, and she said, you should have a webinar, like everything that language access coordinators need to know if they have been doing it uh, briefly or if they are trying to get back into it and you know figure out what the next step is because it's a big confusing job there's all kinds of different things you have to keep track of and it's hard to know where to focus your time and efforts to to do the most good and so that's kind of the the purpose of this hour and it's sort of um all over the map um sort of brainstorming together for different ways that we can make a difference with the limited english proficient people who come before our court system and we'll be recording this uh, webinar and sending it out, putting it on YouTube and sending that to the people who weren't here. Um, and we will welcome your, your questions. You can go in the chat and type questions as we go, and then we'll come back and read them at the end. And we'll have a little discussion period at the end. And so it, because we are recording it, if you don't want your face to be on it, go ahead and turn your camera off. That's fine. We like seeing your faces, but if it's you nice. don't want to be on there, that's fine. Um, Go ahead and keep yourself muted um, for now. And if we, uh, and then at the end when we are taking questions and things, we would be glad to have you unmute and chat for a bit. Um, we will be going until, well, we will be going for an hour. I won't tell you what time it is because you're in different time zones. But, um, but if you want to stay on afterward, if you have additional questions and stuff, we can, um, we can do that. We can, we can just stay on for a little bit afterward and make sure everybody's questions get answered. And I've just put up a little poll asking a few questions about the audience so we can figure out what everyone does. If you see that pop up on your screen, I'd appreciate you filling it out as we're getting started here. Um, so let's see if I can make Zoom work. Uh, full screen. Uh, share screen. Here we go. Um, so could you please give me a thumbs up if you're looking at my PowerPoint now? Yes. Yes? Okay. okay. Yep, I see some yeses. It's just weird, like it'll share one screen, but not the full screen. Okay, there, that's better. So our little poll says that uh, most of you do language access as a main job, but a lot of you have it as an additional duty. Most of you have been in this position under a year. Um, and most of you speak English only, and most of you are not interpreters, so that's very helpful. Yeah, very interesting. That'll help us zoom in on your needs. Um, let everybody in at all. So uh, these are some answers to your questions. A few days ago, I sent out an email to everybody who had signed up by then and said, what is your burning question? What are you most uh, interested in learning more about? And these are the responses I got. And so we've tried to weave some of these into our remarks today. Some of them are kind of too big to deal with, like um, recommendations for tracking systems for, for interpreter needs as they move through the legal system. That's more of a, a technical question. It'd be best to do one on one. But uh, there were some recurring themes. And one of them was how do I deal with negativity among the judges or other court staff who feel it's just a Yes, I have a way to do it. There, oh, there we go. Ah. Yeah. Hey, sorry about that. I just took over. It's okay. <laughs> okay. That's too we owe you. <laughs> Thank you for staying on the call while we troubleshot Ooh. the weird things that Zoom throws our way. Um, I hope I'm not the only one who discovers something, some new way to mess up Zoom every single day. Okay, so these are some of the questions we'll be dealing with, and if we don't get to yours, then uh, we can follow up with that later. Um, okay, table so of contents. yeah, we're just gonna. These are a couple things we're gonna be hitting on. Um, as we said, it looks like a lot of you are kind of new to this, so we'll try to help you get get a few things in place to get started. Marco has a great elephant story; he's really excited about. <laughs> um, my favorite analogy. His favorite thing. Um, how to kind of prioritize some of the things that that we'll talk about how to help the judiciary that you work with to understand what it is that you do and why it's important. And then we'll talk about the difference between interpreters and translators because they are quite different. All right, thank you. 
So first, if you are new on the job, uh, you'll probably have some fires to put out. Probably your predecessor left some, some things on the burner that are now bubbling over that you have to deal with and clean up before you can really get into uh, what's important to you, or you have additional ongoing duties that you need to schedule around. And you may have to book out some time on your calendar in the coming weeks or the coming months to say, this is a meeting with myself, where I'm just gonna focus on doing the reading that I need to do to understand language access and how we make it happen in my state or county or commonwealth or jurisdiction. And then after that, uh, we're gonna talk about how to get out and survey your domain, figure out what's going on in the ground in the real world. So as far as educating yourself, there are a lot of good resources published on lep.gov and I'll be sending you this PowerPoint with the links on there so it'll be clickable. Um, but I would start with the LEP.gov um, resources and then go into the NCSC, the National Center for State Court Resources, and then follow up with the ones for your state or jurisdiction. Um, there's probably a language access plan that somebody has already published and approved that um, governs your courts that you should read and be familiar with. And there may be other written materials, manuals, um, rules, uh, uh, past publications, um, PowerPoints from past presentations or training that your predecessors left that you should read through. And also uh, be familiar with the language needs in your area. What are the top 10 languages that people request in your courts and what uh, interpreters are already available if you are in a state that has credentialed interpreters? Um, what interpreters are available to cover those languages and maybe where are the disconnects? Where do we have a, a high and growing need, say, for the Ukrainian refugee community in your area without any Ukrainian interpreters or Russian interpreters? And, and just a point of clarification, um, he kept talking about the, the LEP website, and LEP stands for Limited English Proficient, and that's a term that's going to get used a lot, so if you didn't know that one, Limited English Proficient just means somebody who maybe they speak English, but not at a native level or varying degrees. It's a broad umbrella term. And I promised myself I wasn't going to use any acronyms today. And you got me. Boom. So these are some talking points that you should have in your back pocket to use at any opportunity. If people want to ask about why do we have to bother with people who don't speak English? You know, this is America. Learn English if you're going to live here. That's a reasonable objection uh, for someone who's new to this uh, effort to this movement. And so it would be good to be able to explain which constitutional amendments to the US Constitution uh, deal with uh, protections like due process, fair trial, and equal protection, um, so that you can explain why these apply to people, regardless of their nationality or the language they speak. And you should also be ready to tell a little bit about the Civil Rights Act of 1964 in Title VI, which prohibits uh, national origin discrimination and has been interpreted since then by various decisions and policies and rules as including the language spoken by people because of their national origin. And then learn about the laws and the rules in your own jurisdiction that uh, more directly affect your judges and court staff. Uh, uh, <laughs> survey your domain, Marco. <laughs> I like to think of uh, our domains as being sort of like a, a kingdom spread out below the castle walls. I think this is probably the Great Wall of China, right? I have no idea. It looks kind of like it. Yeah. I yeah. guess that's Great Wall of China. Never been there. So I would encourage you to get out and just walk around and meet people. It's easy to get stay cooped up in your office, especially if you're working remotely. But if your courts are open and if you have a travel stipend and you can drive around and visit different courts around your, your state or your region, get out there and just introduce yourself to people and say, hey, I'm the person in charge of foreign languages. Um, how does it work around here? Do you guys ever have anyone who doesn't speak English? What do you do? And those uh, informal conversations are low pressure and you get a lot better information than you do by sending out an official survey and asking people to fill it out. People don't like surveys. I, I never fill out surveys. No. I never do. Even the mandatory surveys from my kids' school, <laughs> I don't fill them out. But if if a teacher says, hey, Margaret, what do you think about this new thing that we're doing at school? I'll be like, oh, well, you know, I think blah, 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 blah. And if you go and talk to people, an occasional attorney, a, a court reporter, a judge, whomever, to just kind of get a feel for what's working in their courts and what's not. You're not there to check off boxes and say, well, they're not doing this right and they're not doing that, but just to, to get some information and to let them know who you are and let them know that you're a resource for them. And as you go along in this 
field, you'll, you'll become a greater and greater resource for them to help them with language access. And it's also helpful to pretend like you don't speak English, just tell yourself, pick a language. I only know Japanese and I'm walking into this courthouse and I'm looking around for anything that makes sense to me. Are there um, symbols that I can read, you know, like the restroom symbol or the elevator symbol or the handicapped access symbol, those are universal. But other than that, if I was trying to find somebody who'd help me in Japanese, where would I go and who would I talk to? Are, is there anything on any of the posters or the information display racks that would help me find my way or do it with a more common language, something that you know is present in your area? And just sort of, it's like mystery shopping. In the business world, they have mystery shoppers who go in and pretend to be a Walmart shopper. And then they fill out a report for the manager saying, this is the way your employees treated me. And this is, um, this is, uh, these are things I liked and didn't like about your store. That's kind of what we're doing. And it's not so we can catch people doing things wrong. Um, we're not the IRS, we're not auditing them, but we're just going out and seeing what they're doing well that we can compliment them on and encourage. And then what are some areas that we could help them improve on? And there's so much to language access. Um, it's, it's a big, Marco says it's a big messy puzzle. Um, I like to think of it as a pie because I prefer pie to puzzles, <laughs> um, but I, I'm still only going to get through that pie one bite at a time. And so just don't, don't panic that you can't eat the whole pie at once or that you can't put the whole puzzle together in one sitting. It's going to take some time to work through it and, and we'll get it done. Just a piece at a time, a bite at a time. All right. So straight talk if it seems confusing and you're new to the job it's because it's very confusing it's sort of amorphous and ambiguous what's expected of you so we're going to do a little uh language fun poll here because for us language geeks everything to do with languages is fun and you are um uh, going to see a pop-up on your screen that has these questions on there and i just love to have you give your best guess and maybe you'll learn something new about languages that you can share with people in your courts and people like to say there are no wrong answers. There are wrong answers, <laughs> but it doesn't matter. Nobody's grading you. We just want to know, do you happen to know the answer to these? So just click through. Do you yeah. all see the poll? Did it pop up? OK, all right. just take a couple well, minutes. Wild guess. Run through. Fun to watch the bars moving in and out mm -hmm. as they go. Ooh, yeah. This is going to be eye opening. Uh -huh. <laughs> Very interesting. Yeah. I would have gotten half these wrong myself yeah, until yeah. yesterday oh, when I looked them up. Absolutely. <laughs> Yeah, I think I got like two of them right. Okay, I think that looks like a lull, so I'm going to end the poll and share it. Um, these are our best guesses. Uh, looks like dialects of Arabic, five or 15. Um, most Spanish speakers tied between Mexico and the US. Native languages of Mexico, 68 was the winner. Most English speakers, USA was the winner. How many native languages does China have? 21 was the winner. India, 447. And in the world, 7,100. Well, that last one was right. But these are the answers. Um, Arabic has 25 dialects, some of which are mutually intelligible, but some which are so far removed that they can't really figure out what the other person's saying. And there is sort of a universal formal educated variety that's used in formal settings it, among people who have that education. Um, the US has more Spanish speakers in Mexico or Spain. Uh, Mexico has 68 native languages, which is Spanish and 67 others, which are indigenous languages, which are not dialects, which are separate mutually incomprehensible languages for the most part. India has more English speakers in the US by far. Um, China has 302 separate languages, not dialects, separate languages with dialects underneath those languages. Um, India has 447, and there are over 7,000 in the world. So 
Um, if you didn't think your job was big and amorphous and nebulous before, now you know that it is, it's even worse than you knew. <laughs> Fortunately, most of us never have more than about 20 or 30 languages that are requested in our jurisdictions because a lot of people like in China who might speak a regional language also speak Mandarin, the main national language, or from Mexico, maybe their native language is Nahuatl, but they also speak um, Spanish uh, pretty well. And so it's the people who come from more rural areas from indigenous tribes, which are sometimes the hardest to staff an interpreter for. And, and we often use a, a relay system where there's like a Nahuatl to Spanish interpreter speaking to the defendant, and then the Spanish to English interpreter is going, forming a bridge to speak to the court. You'll find that with ASL as well, because 90% uh, of deaf children are born to hearing parents. 90% of deaf children are born to hearing parents, which means the parents are, are surprised and don't really know what to do and may not get them educated in ASL at a young age. And so they, they have a lot of sort of made up signs, home signs, sort of a pigeon uh, sign language. And so a lot of deaf folks do not know formal ASL like the ASL interpreter that learned their ASL and, and studied proper um, sign language. And so they'll have what we call certified deaf interpreters, meaning the person themselves is deaf, but they know a lot of different kinds of signs and sign language. And so they will, so it's again, a relay interpreter, the, the let's say the, the witness who only knows home signs goes to the certified deaf interpreter, deaf interpreter to the ASL interpreter, to the judge, the attorney, whomever. And so we'll, we do that in other languages as well, like Marco said, the, the Nahuatl to Spanish, Spanish to English and back. So that takes a while, but. And, and it's kind of like the game you play as kids at a party sitting around the table and passing a message and whispering it to each telephone. person. The more people that the message has to go through, the, the less of the original content gets through and everybody has to try really hard to preserve as much meaning as possible. Okay, so uh, Marco has this book that he's read. <laughs> Not my favorite book, but top 10. Yeah, um, and where did you say you first encountered the book? Um, I was on a, the board of uh, an interpreter association and the president gave it to everybody to help to read sort of as we came together as a new board of does for our talking points. And the gist of it is, um, it's hard to change. People don't like to change and it's hard to do it sometimes. And sometimes we really want to have, say, a beach body, but we also really want to have an Oreo. And how, how to get to, how to work the emotional mind and the rational mind together to, to accomplish the change that you need to accomplish. And you may find this in your own life, uh, trying to form good habits, or you may find it as a leader of the language access um, paradigm shift in your county or commonwealth or state. And it's, it's helpful to sort of uh, break down um, what seem like obstacles into the emotional problem versus the intellectual problem versus just the systemic problem. What processes could you put in place to make it simpler and more straightforward? Uh, here's a this is a diagram from this book um, who the authors they they're organizational psychologists and they talk about directing the writer meaning appeal to the rational mind of your judges for example by helping them to understand the legal basis for language access and motivating the elephant here's a writer on top of an elephant who's trying to get it to go through the jungle motivating the elephant means appealing to them emotionally um, get tugging at their heartstrings helping them to feel compassion and sympathy for the people that need language help and then shaping the path is making it clear and simple kind of like uh, amazon has the order now button where all you have to do is literally click on one button one click. or say to alexa alexa send me more socks don't i'm just kidding stop i'm going to turn off my alexa here she's already she's already, she's already confused you do? <laughs> <laughs> they make it as easy as possible by shaping the shh, 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 shh. I shouldn't have said her name. Why I should did have you said, do that? I should have said some of the name. What was I thinking? I do not know. Okay, <laughs> so, next slide. So here's a little uh, sort of an animation that explains the analogy and how we can apply it. Let me make sure that the sound is shared. Um, share sound. Here we go again. Yeah. Psychologists know that there are two systems in our brains, 
the rational system and the emotional system. Jonathan Haidt, who's a psychologist at NYU, came up with a great analogy for these two systems. He said, think of your brain as a human rider atop an elephant. The rider represents the rational system. That's the part of us that plans and problem solves. The rider might do some analyzing and decide, hey, I want to go that way. But it's the elephant representing the emotional system that provides the power for the journey. The rider can try to lead the elephant or drag the elephant, but if these two ever disagree, who would you bet on? The elephant has a six ton weight advantage, and it's exactly that power imbalance that makes adopting new behaviors very hard. If you want this duo to head a new direction, you also need to think about the path, which represents the external environment. This duo is more likely to complete a journey if you can shorten the distance and remove any obstacles in their way. So bottom line, if you want to lead change, you've got to do three things. Give direction to the rider, knowledge of how to get to the destination. You've got to motivate the elephant, which means tapping into emotion. And finally, you need to shape the path to allow for easy progress. That's how change happens. <laughs> Whoops. Okay. So we're going to apply that analogy to some of our examples that are coming up. Um, I think it's helpful for me when I'm trying to choose my path forward in a complicated project to see everything fall somewhere on the spectrum. Uh, if it were the ideal project, it would be all the way on the left on all, all four of these. And if it were the, the worst project in the world, it'd be all the way on the right. And nothing is, nothing really falls into those categories. Nothing's ever all on the left. <laughs> right. We, we want it to be as free, as fast, as easy, and as helpful as possible. Um, but here's an example. So um, let's say you have no certification in your state and you want to launch a program from scratch on how to certify interpreters. That's a big project. It's probably going to cost some bucks. It's going to take a while. It is going to be a challenge for you to do, but it's going to be super duper helpful for your state, for your language access, for the people in the state. It's going to be a great thing, but it's not going to be easy or fast or free. It's going to take some, some effort. Um, but super useful. So we would not describe that as a low hanging fruit. No, no. As opposed to? As opposed to maybe finding out about things that are going on in your area, like a judges meeting about language access, where there's already a group of judges who are already talking about the topic. And maybe you can volunteer to do a little presentation about language access. It wouldn't cost you anything. You'd be able to do it in a short period of time, maybe put together a PowerPoint presentation or something like that. Um, it wouldn't be real difficult. You, you, you take some of the, the information off the um, website links that we're providing to you. And it's not the most helpful. It's not going to instantly solve all your problems, but it's helpful. It's, it's getting going in the right direction. And so we would call this more of a low hanging fruit, something that's not going to be a huge challenge, but is going to offer some benefit to you and to your um, to the citizens of your area. And in terms of judges meetings, that could be a regular monthly meeting of all the judges in a certain courthouse, or it could be here in Texas, we have something called baby judges school. I don't think we call it that to their face, like that's so. sort of the, 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 the end joke, but uh, the baby judge is somebody who's just elected. And so after every election cycle, when they're about to take office, they spend a week at a series of seminars learning how to be a judge, basically, and not just a lawyer. And so that's a great time to try to get on the agenda for the next um, baby judges school or whatever you call it there, because they're more open minded at that point and they're willing to learn new information and accept it as a norm, while a judge who's been on the bench for 30 years might just be more resistant to change. Might be. Pro tip, do not call it baby judges school. <laughs> Unless, let them call it that first. Right. So um, here I have a picture, it's probably Norman Rockwell, of somebody who has analysis paralysis. You don't want to make the leap because you're too busy trying to plan ahead and worry about everything that might go wrong. 
And I am here to encourage you just to jump in and pick something, pick something easy to start out with and try it out. And if it doesn't work, well, fine, try out something else. There are so many options of things that you can start with. And, and as we've said earlier, we, like you want to be able to make some kind of plan and start going after things. But it's okay to start with easy things. It's okay to just start somewhere with something that you feel you can manage. Um, for example, uh, we've got on here website information for the public. So, so whatever website your judiciary uses, maybe just talk to the webmaster about having a plugin that does a little automatic translation for you. We're going to talk a little bit more about Google Translate um, in a little bit. Um, it's it's not the best, but it is not the devil, and it can help. It's a lot better than nothing. Yeah. Um, getting some articles written. Uh, again, we, we mentioned meeting presentations. What else? Public swearing in. Oh, this one's a good one. Oh, yeah. Some, we don't do this in Texas, but I wish we did. Whenever a new crop of interpreters gets certified or licensed or registered, they have an optional day when they can go to the Supreme Court and be sworn in in front of the Chief Justice. And they feel really special. And it's a photo op. You can write a little article and put it in your internal newsletter or send it out to the newspaper and get some good press for the interpretation program. And it's very motivational for the interpreters. It makes them feel recognized as officers of the court and gives them a, a little better status. So um, that's that's a very inexpensive and fairly straightforward event to organize. And you can, if it's never been done in your in your county or your area before, you could do it retroactively for everybody who's already a court interpreter. It'd be fun. And the interpreters would like to meet each other because usually we are separated and we never see each other. Uh, you can set up uh, tours of courts and shadowing of working interpreters by prospective interpreters. There's a big emotional barrier when you're a new interpreter. Um, you're terrified of going to court for the first time. You don't want to mess up and have someone sent to jail because you couldn't remember that word for that one thing that that was just at the tip of your tongue. And so spending time in court before you actually start interpreting can really help with those emotional challenges. Um, also, if if you happen to know or if you do a little research and find out that there's any kind of interpreter program at a, a local university or college in your area, you might reach out to the professor or professors in that program and invite those prospective interpreters to come watch a trial or a hearing or a whatever, so, something that's going on or give them a tour just to give them a feel. Um, I, I'm sure the professor would love the opportunity to get get um, his or her um, interpreting students into a courtroom to see what the lay of the land and how things work. Field trip. Yeah, field trip. There are um, telephonic interpretation services like uh, Language Line Solutions is the biggest one. Uh, Lionbridge is another one. And these are huge companies that have thousands of interpreters under contract. Some of them are sitting in big call centers and some of them are working out of their homes. But basically, they're just standing by kind of like um, interpretation 911 waiting for you to call them. and they, there are challenges using them in the courtroom. They're usually not uh, court certified or trained, but for customer service uses, like somebody coming in and saying, I got this letter from the court, what am I supposed to do at the front desk? Um, that's a great solution. You don't even have to have a formal contracting process in place. You can just pay by the minute. You know, if you're on the minute for seven, uh, phone for seven minutes with a Spanish interpreter at the end of the month, they invoice your your um, bookkeepers for seven minutes of interpretation and you pay as you go. Another free option that does something similar but not as well is the Google Translate app. Uh, I'm going to demonstrate and there are other apps, other companies that do this, but we're gonna pretend like I'm a Spanish speaker who's come into the courthouse and I have a question for Margaret here who only speaks English and we're just gonna see, this is unscripted, we're gonna see if we can understand each other. So, um, uh, disculpa, buenas tardes, señora, es que me cayó esta carta por correo, no sé de qué se trata, pero tiene la dirección aquí del Palacio de Justicia, ¿me podría ayudar? And it says, uh, excuse me, good afternoon, ma'am, I got this letter in the mail, I don't know what it's about, but you have the address here for the Palace of Justice. Could you help me? Okay, and how do I hit this, okay. Can you show me the letter? Do you mind if I read the letter so I can see how I can help you? So here we just ran into one of the bugs in the system. It was listening for Spanish, and so it didn't understand what she said because she was speaking English. 
So your people would have to be trained to um, account for this and go back in and switch. Let's put it in conversation mode. Okay, and now, otra vez, por favor. Uh, can you show me the letter? Do you mind if I see the letter so I can try to help you? ¿Puedes mostrarme la carta? ¿Te importa si veo la carta para que pueda tratar de ayudar? So that, that's pretty good Spanish. That makes mm -hmm. sense. I would understand it if I weren't an English speaker. You would have understood yeah. what I said. Yeah, yeah. Um, so that oh, does, awesome. yeah, it, it does have uh, a place, and especially for the more obscure languages, like if you have your first Nepali speaker come into your courthouse and you don't have any Nepalese, Nepalese, Nepali, I don't even know <laughs> what you call it, oh, Nepali. <laughs> okay, anyway, you, you know what I mean. If you don't have anybody for that language, start with Google Translate. Um, it's, a, it's an emergency stopgap measure until you build up to the point where you have a budget to find a telephonic interpretation. Uh, bench cards, most of you have probably heard of these. It's a one page front and back, usually laminated or card stock summary for the judges on some topic, like in this case, uh, how to use an interpreter. And it would have the verbiage for swearing in an interpreter, the hotline for calling to get an interpreter, um, the a summary of the rules for how to use an interpreter, maybe some important terminology that comes up in interpreted cases. And you provide that to the judges as part of their training, and then they keep it on file. And, and in some places, they won't need it more than once every year or two years if you have mostly an English speaking population. But having it all in one uh, simple resource to consult makes it a lot more likely they'll remember what to do when the time comes. And also, um, the I speak cards, which you may be familiar with, that have just I speak Nepalese, I speak. Bulgarian, I speak Spanish, written in that language so people can look at it, find their language, and point to the one that is their language, and then you know, and you have it in parentheses in, in English what that language is, so that you can be sure you're getting an interpreter for language that they speak and you're not just having to guess. And anything that we mention that we don't have a link for, jot it down or put it in the chat and say, hey, I need that, and we can, we can <laughs> yeah. send it to you. Yeah. Um, so one um, fairly low hanging fruit would be forms. If there's some basic forms that the public needs to fill out for your jurisdiction, can you tell us the different ways to approach bilingual forms, Margaret? Okay, so one of them that we have here, this is interlinear translation, which means you've got everything in two languages on the same page. And so you can see that, th that this one, oh, is this? It's not a good example. No, I don't know what language that is off the top of my Hindi, head. Hindi, probably. Yeah, yeah. anyway. Um, but it's, it's got both the, the foreign language and the English side by side. Um, the, the advantage of this is everything's in one spot. And so you, they only have to put answers in one place and everybody can look at the one paper and see what's going on. The disadvantages is, is that it's hard to cram all that information onto a page. And so you end up just things end up formatting weird and, and that sort of thing, but it, it's, it's good. Um, the other option then would be to separate the information and have the English version and the non-English version on two separate pages and you just give them the one that they they need. I would recommend, this, is, this example doesn't show, but I would recommend numbering the blanks or numbering the information, name is number one, sex is number two, birth date number three, social security number four, whatever, so that you, it's easier to find the information that you're looking for. You can look, maybe do a fillable PDF in, a, in the foreign language and then that can be auto-filled into the English form, there are lots of ways to, to do it. So if you're limited English proficient court client um, visitor uh, has access to technology, a smartphone or a computer and can type it in, that makes it easier for everybody. But we've seen that often it's somebody who uh, doesn't have that kind of technology and just has to write everything by hand. And so um, if it's handwritten, then you have to have a a human involved who's good at reading challenging handwriting to make sense of the form and type it in. And sometimes that is a scribe. I know, I don't know if anybody here on the call is from New Mexico, but New Mexico has a great program called uh, the Volunteer Scribes or the Scribing Program. Mm -hmm. And it's just people who go and sit in the courthouse and hang out in the lobby and um, they help people fill out forms. And if it's an English speaker who's semi-literate, then they will read the form and ask them the question and then write down the answer. If it's a Spanish speaker and it's a bilingual scriber, then they will fill out the um, information that they are told in Spanish. They'll write it out in English so that it can be submitted. And so that's one way to get around uh, helping write people. It in English or I, write in Spanish? I think um, in New Mexico, they probably write it in Spanish. Okay. 
Um, but in, in most states uh, that do everything in English, they would, they would translate as they go. And so if you have digital forms, then you can have a drop down like this built in. Um, and you would have translators working with the programmers to get the form into those different languages. And then you have to figure out how to get it back into English so that the court can process it. And that's another piece of a complicated puzzle. Okay. And um, here's a, uh, another project that we found to be very, very helpful for the courts in Texas. This is uh, Fernanda Calderon, who's a friend of mine who was a staff interpreter at our um, county criminal court here until she moved to Europe with her husband and is living the dream now. Um, but uh, we, we were just working on a bunch of DWI body cam stops where the officers would try to interview somebody who spoke Spanish and do the field sobriety test and all. And there's this uh, statutory warning that they have to give them about getting their license revoked. And um, the officers often spoke Spanish a little bit, but they would try to read the card out loud in Spanish because they had a bilingual form, but their, their pronunciation was so bad that we could tell the drunk guy couldn't understand what they were saying. And so we're like, we should just record this and put it there in writing and put it on YouTube and send it out to all the sheriff's associations and DPS and stuff and tell them, just hand them your phone and play the video and then you don't have to worry about it. And so we, we stuck exactly to the verbiage of their special, official Spanish version, even though we didn't like it. <laughs> it wasn't a great translation, but we, wanted, we didn't want to give them any excuse not to use it. Um, in a couple of places, we added little parentheticals for a better, a better rendering because interpreters are snooty that way. But um, we published it several years ago, and then we started hearing it being played in future body cam recordings. Officers were using it. And then they updated the form, and so we updated the, the video, and there's a link here when you get the PowerPoints if you want to watch it. This is the kind of thing that you can do in, in a day. I mean, it took us a couple hours to set up and half an hour to record it and a couple hours to do the video editing and put the, the titles on there and then posted it, and it was easy, and we did it as volunteers, and nobody paid anything for it. And so if you're in one of those states that has no budget, find somebody who works in like a community activism in one of the nonprofits that supports immigrants and just talk to them about this and say, look, um, I would love to do something like this for the Miranda warnings or something yeah. that, uh, warnings that are given a lot to- Didn't we do a Miranda? Um, it's been a while if we did. Yeah. Um, it, we'll, we'll dig around. See it wasn't happens. as big of a YouTube sensation. <laughs> it didn't go viral. <laughs> but whatever the standard warnings are in your jurisdiction, think about getting um, easy, straightforward versions and law enforcement will appreciate it. Even the ones who aren't really interested in other languages will be like, fine, I don't have to worry about how to handle these cases. And it's just one more um, thing that makes my life easier. And do get a native speaker of the language to do the recording because it's hard for any of us to to understand a foreign accent or, you know, and if, if somebody with a real strong American accent is doing the recording, it may be hard for the poor drunk guy on the side of the road to understand what's being said. So get a native speaker of whatever language it is that you're doing the recording in to, to do that for you. You're good at this. Okay. Oh, so language access is a journey. So um, there's a lot about language access that is beneficial to all of us. Um, and so, and I forgot to look up this term. There's a term that that uh, I've learned that means that something that's good for one group of people, something that's developed for one group of people benefits a whole bunch of other people. For example, uh, even before the Americans with Disabilities Act came out, uh, there were wheelchair ramps, but after the ADA came out, wheelchair ramps were built all over the place because suddenly people had to provide access for people in wheelchairs. The great thing was suddenly people who were dragging suitcases behind them had ramps also and and parents pushing strollers had had ramps also and lots of pe people who can't get upstairs but can go up a, sl a, a slope had access to things people and so a walker. yeah so there were a lot of people that benefited from that that development and the same is true for lots of other areas in our lives for for poverty um those in poverty deaf blind language um, various things, language access is the same. There are lots of things that benefit people specifically who are less um, limited English proficient, but that allow for easier language access, even for people whose English is pretty good. And it reminds me of, of court reporters. Sometimes the court reporters 
you know, like if they're freelancers, they don't like to have an interpreter there because then they don't get as many words per hour that they can bill for. But if they are our staff, they will say, oh, I'm so glad to have an interpreter here because that means everyone has to speak slowly and there's a bunch of pauses in there. So it's easy for me to do my job and keep up. Mm. So we can't help everyone, of course, um, but we can help someone sometimes and then we can build on each little success. We can look at good solutions for now and better solutions for next year and think about one generation hence, what would be the best uh, solution that we can gradually build towards. Um, in the, this book that I mentioned, Switch by Chip and Dan Heath, they talk about looking for the bright spots. And that means um, instead of focusing, oh, I don't know, did I put the video on here? No. You put the link on okay, there, there's a link. You can watch it later. Instead of focusing on the problems, um, look for the things that are being done well and figure out how to clone those successes in other contexts. And my example is when I was uh, a new language access coordinator in 2011, I was going around trying to convince all these judges that they should call into our hotline and have me interpret over the phone for protective order applications for free. The state was paying for it and the local budget didn't have to pay and I could offer um, what I, what we believe was a higher quality interpretation than what they were doing in the rural counties was just grabbing anybody who had a Hispanic surname and say, here, you speak Spanish, right? Can you come in and translate for this lady? And they were trying, they were forcing people to interpret who didn't want to and who hadn't been trained to do it. And so um, it was hard to suggest that, that calling somebody in and doing it over the phone would be better because that was a, a strange way to do it until uh, one judge, like I, yeah, I was hitting my head against the wall, and then finally this one judge, this young guy at a rural county out towards Big Bend, um, heard about it, and he's like, yes, I've been hoping somebody would come up with a way to get interpreters by phone because I don't have a single interpreter in my county, and my county is the size of Connecticut, and um, it takes hours for somebody to drive in here, and I don't have the budget to hire them. Can I just call you, and it's free. This is wonderful, and he loved it, and he became our cheerleader, and he wanted to try all the new stuff and he wanted to make presentations to other judges about how great it was. And so he became an early bright spot in our efforts that we could then clone and have him be a, a, a sales force, our guy on the inside um, to promote it to other people. And no matter where you are, there will be people who are early adopters who can do the same magic for you. So it's a, it's a big community we're talking about. These are some of the stakeholders involved in language access. You've got your judges, your administrators, your attorneys on staff, like the prosecutors, um, courthouse staff of all kinds, bailiffs and help desks and clerks. Uh, there's private counsel that comes in and is involved in all different types of cases. There's law enforcement. Um, both in the judiciary and you know out on the streets uh, there are nonprofits that are working with different immigrant communities and all kinds of uh, community groups that represent uh, specialized interests and in each one of these sectors you can direct the mind by giving people factual information that's useful um, about uh, translation interpretation you can motivate them by telling stories a lot of motivation comes down to storytelling let me tell you about somebody I interpreted for and it changed my life and it made me love my job. And I've got a lot of stories, but time is short. So we'll have to save that for, for uh, the second episode here. And then shaping the path, just make it as simple as possible. Um, any, removing obstacles. Any bureaucratic steps you can remove. Yeah, removing obstacles to, to the success of whatever plan or program you're trying to put into place. We often think in terms of how can I get judges to use interpreters more? And, and that's important. We definitely want to do that. But there's a lot of there are a lot of other people um, involved in the process. And the more people broadly that you get on your side and, and are involved in in making sure that that everyone has proper language access in the courtroom, the better and, and the easier your job is. So these are some examples of uh, complaints that we've heard and and raise your hand if you've ever um, gotten any of these responses from somebody that you were talking to in the courts. Um, things like, his English is good enough, he's just faking it because he's trying to delay his hearing, you know, he's just pretending he doesn't understand, but, but he's lived here in the US for years, I'm sure his English is good enough, don't worry about it. Or, you know, she's from South America, so we got a Spanish interpreter, you know, maybe she's from that French speaking country or that Portuguese speaking country. <laughs> Or, or I'm just so frustrated um, trying to deal with this person and 
um, I can't understand what she's saying or anything as such as I'm not prejudiced, but you can you can be assured that something following after that will be will reflect a, a, a limited uh, a sense of compassion for the limited English proficient person. And not all of this is 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 with with malintent. Uh, you know, some people just honestly don't understand. I heard her speaking with her lawyer. It sounded fine to me. And yes, there is a, an element of of ability to speak but still inability to understand court proceedings. I am a native English speaker. I don't want to go into court unprepared. I don't know all the legalese that's gonna happen in there. And I'm fluent in Spanish, but let me tell you, I do not wanna be in court in Spain without an interpreter. I know legal Spanish, but I do not understand court proceedings in Spanish. And I do not want to be trying to, to figure out how to, how to communicate with my attorney and with the judge and and all the rules and regulations of, of court etiquette. I don't, I don't know. I, I would be totally lost. Yeah. We moved to Saudi Arabia several years ago so I could take an English teaching job there. And then back. 15 back. years ago, I guess. And I thought my Arabic was really good when I got there. I'd been studying for years. I was so proud of myself. And then I got stopped for a speeding ticket and they, they wrote out this form and they gave it to me. And I didn't understand a word the police said to me. I looked at the form, I didn't know a single word on the page except for the numbers, which are the same. Um, well, on this form anyways. And I took it back to work the next day and I asked one of my Arabic speaking buddies, and he's like, oh, you got a speeding ticket. You've got to do this and this and that. And, and it just struck me like a load of bricks. Oh, I don't know any of the legal Arabic. I only know stuff like how to order falafel and how to pick up my dry cleaning, but it's an entirely different pool of vocabulary. And so I've been trying for years to communicate this to people who just haven't had that eye-opening experience I had. And I came up with this little video that I'm gonna show you and um, hopefully it will explain better than I can. Uh, let's do share sound, okay. I need to add some music to that. Uh, u hebt de gelegenheid om vandaag al een verklaring af te leggen. Zoals gezegd gaan we niet de zaak inhoudelijk behandelen, maar u wilt misschien vandaag al iets kwijt. Uh, u hebt de gelegenheid om vandaag al een verklaring af te leggen. Zoals gezegd gaan we niet de zaak inhoudelijk behandelen, maar u wilt misschien vandaag al iets kwijt. Did you get it that time? Come on. Should I play it louder? Was it not loud enough for you? Three thousand words is considered fluent. That's all you need to know, huh? There we go. <laughs> that should be better after a year. En u hebt ook verteld aan de politie dat u toen merkte dat er iets aan de hand was. En dat u constateerde dat zij niet meer leefde. Ja. En ik het. Ja. So this is just a little two minute commercial for language access that you're going to get when, in, when I send you the, the PowerPoint that I hope you will share and maybe it will help people to understand that there's a difference between conversational fluency and the large vocabulary of an educated native speaker and most of what is said in court is down here in the bottom part of the iceberg. Way, way, way down, way down. So I resisted as long as I could putting up a picture of our kids. 
<laughs> this is a million years ago. This is from 2002. They are grown adults and do not tell them that we put this picture. <laughs> Luckily, they don't watch any of our social media content. <laughs> but we have four kids. These are the, the twins. They're fraternal twins and they are very different. Um, and it's sort of a metaphor, if you will, for how interpreters and translators are like twin careers, but they're very different. And if any of you are interpreters, forgive my gross oversimplification. This is tongue in cheek, of course, but this is how I think of interpreters on the left. I'm more of an interpreter. Yes, you are. And this is how I think of translators on the right. Margaret's got more of that translator personality. I don't own several cats. <laughs> And I do travel and I don't post anywhere on anything, but <laughs> I do have good spelling and I, you have good spelling too. No, I ask the A-L-E-X-A how to spell stuff yeah. all the time. Yeah. Um, translators are the people who carry around a Sharpie and when they go to like a restaurant that has a sign up in the, their foreign language, they go in and like add the accent marks to, to make it correct. I use pencil. <laughs> so interpreters, this is Lorena Devlin, a federal court interpreter and professor here, friend of ours. Um, interpreters may be employees of the courts, they may be freelancers who come in on a contract basis, or they may be freelancers who work for an agency that contracts with the courts. Um, and almost most interpreters worldwide are uh, sole proprietors who uh, work for a lot of different clients. That's sort of the way that the market is set up. And what you should know about interpreters is that all of us are terrified when we first start this job. I teach uh, college classes for interpreters. And every one of them says things like, I would love to be a court interpreter. It seems really cool, but it scares me to death. I didn't sleep at all last night because I was scared enough coming to this court interpreting class, much less um, really working in court. And so there's a lot that you as an administrator can do to lower that anxiety level and help them ease into the job. You can pilfer court interpreters from the ranks of non-court interpreters when you can't find a good court interpreter, find a medical interpreter, They'll do a lot better job than just the bilingual guy on the street or a community interpreter who might be working in a nonprofit might be interpreting in a religious setting or in a social cool. services setting. Yeah. And that link is to a, a webinar I did earlier this year about all the different places to find interpreters um, going through the various national associations like NAGIT and ATA and through some of the other um, the medical interpreter and if it's ASL there's different ASL uh, directories that you can look in. Five minute warning, sir. Five minute warning. Whoa. Yeah, you gotta talk to okay. us. Okay. Um, certified interpreters from another state are usually a good bet, though there will be certain things about the way your state does things that uh, will be new to them. Uh, beware of agencies. They like to say, yes, we have certified interpreters, but then they don't actually send out the certified interpreter. They just have them somewhere on their roster, but they weren't available that day. And they neglect to mention this person has no credential whatsoever. Um, so do your due diligence to figure out the credentials of the actual person who is who is taking your call or is, who is appearing there. And there are three modes of interpretation. A lot of um, non-court interpreters will not be good at simultaneous interpreting or sight translation, which are the two modes that are used less in the other fields. And, and uh, for explanation, simultaneous is when the interpreter is sitting next to, say, the defendant, and everything that's going on is being whispered in the ear of the defendant. And so it's happening all at the same time. Nobody stops, nobody pauses. The, the judge talks, the attorneys talk, and the interpreter sits right there and just the whole time. It's a very taxing on the brain. Consecutive is when there's somebody up on the stand, maybe a witness, and the interpreter is standing next to them often and interpreting for the whole court. So the witness will say something and then pause and the interpreter will tell the court what they said. And then a question will be asked and the interpreter interprets, but it, it goes back and forth. People take turns in consecutive uh, words, pause, explanation, pause, words. All right. And then site translation, looking at a document. And so generally the progression is a beginner does consecutive best and then works his or her way up to uh, learning simultaneous. So as a little um, illustration for what it's like when you're trying to teach people who only speak one language, it's hard to demonstrate going back and forth between the languages in a meaningful way. Um, but um, we use a, an exercise called shadowing where the person listens in one language. In this case, Margaret will be our guinea pig. Thank you. So nice of you. Um, and she'll be listening in English with her eyes closed and you'll be reading along in English. And she's going to be trying to uh, repeating everything that she hears in the same language. Um, right after she hears it, simulating what a simultaneous interpreter would do, and then we'll ask her what the experience is like. And and 
to be clear, I'm, I'm hearing English and I'm just saying it in English. And I, I am educated and I, I am And smart, you know these words. And I know these words. <laughs> I'm not going into a foreign language. I'm just doing English. And this text is verbatim one that I was given in court a couple of years ago. It's a jury charge. And so this is very realistic language that a court interpreter would have to deal with. So I Where, what, close. What am I listening to? Um, Are you going to hand me something to listen um, to? No, we're going to play it out of oh, the okay, speakers. Okay. Here we go. So, okay, so, do I need to be so, closer so, yeah, to the microphone? You speak up so they can hear you and they can evaluate you. But be nice, everybody. Okay. A person acts recklessly person acts or is recklessly, reckless with respect to circumstances surrounding circumstances his conduct surrounding or the result of his conduct when he is aware of but consciously, of, disregards consciously disregards a substantial and unjustifiable, and unjustifiable risk, risk that the circumstances uh, exist or the result will occur. Or, the risk must be of such a nature and degree that its disregard constitutes a gross deviation from the standard of care that an ordinary person would exercise under all the circumstances as viewed from the defendant's standpoint. Can we be done with this already? Okay, that was that was two sentences. Bravo. Oh, you're kidding. Yes. Um, in court, um, a lot of courts will hire a single interpreter for eight hours of simultaneous doing that for eight hours in, into another language. Oh. And it's, it's very eye opening when you try to do it in English for the first time, English to English, you're like, wow, just the mental task of listening and speaking by itself is, is exhausting. My brain melted just a little yeah. bit. When I, if I have to do that for eight hours, I won't drive after that because I'm worse than drunk at the end of the day. My brain is so tired. Um, and so in, in a situation where you have an interpreter who can't do simultaneous, sort of a fallback is to do something similar, but in the consecutive mode, meaning the speaker will pause every, every half sentence or so um, and, and for the uh, interpreter to interpret. And so we're going to demonstrate that briefly. Okay. So we're going to close your eyes again. Okay. Yep. This is much easier. You're, you'll like me. Okay. Is there any okay. way I can sit closer to the speaker? Yeah. Just put not here. Where's the speaker? This thing? Over there. Okay. No, it's over there. Oh, Okay. No, I can't see the screen. Sorry. <laughs> All, right. All right. If you believe from the evidence. If you believe from the evidence. Beyond a reasonable doubt. Beyond a reasonable doubt. That the defendant Jose Falcon Urrutia. That the defendant Jose Falcon Urrutia. On or about the 21st day of May 2015. On or about um, May 21st, 2015. In the county of Travis. In the county of Travis. And state of Texas. State of Texas. As alleged in the indictment. As alleged in the indictment. If you believe from the evidence. Okay. Good okay. job. Give it up for Margaret. That was way easier. But even still, I realized partway through that you said the 21st of May, whatever, whatever, and I said May 21st, whatever. Sure. But, but going in another language, that would be irrelevant. So um, these are in your slides. If you'd like to use this as a demonstration, what I like to do is pull out 20 bucks. And when I go speak at a bench and bar conference and say, I'll give 20 bucks to anybody in the audience who can come up here for one minute and listen to English and just say out loud what you hear. Easy, easy 20 bucks. We'll take it. And somebody always comes up. Um, somebody, some hams like, yeah, I don't care. I'll do it. And they come up and they try to do it and they can get through like the first five words and then they start messing up on word six and word seven. They're like, holy cow, I had no idea that'd be so hard to just listen and talk. Are at you the same only time. giving them the money if they say every word? Yeah, yeah, and I've never lost the money. <laughs> so we're moving on now from the twin on the left to the twin on the right. This is translation. Um, translators may work also for an employee as a freelancer for the courts or through an agency for the courts. Often a translator will not understand legal language, but they have the luxury of doing research and looking stuff up if they are competent and finding out the right way to say it. And in the US, there's no government certification, but the American Translator Association is a professional certification that's a big deal. It's like 1% of the population of translators has that. So that's a, you can be sure that that translator will uh, do his or her due diligence and give you a pretty good quality product. Translators are not a commodity. Um, they vary wildly in quality, speed, and price. Wildly. Most translators now will use computer-assisted translation software, which is not like Google Translate. It might incorporate that element, but what it does is it recycles sentences and phrases from old translations that a human has done, and it suggests it for the new ones, and that helps keep them consistent if you have a large body of translations. If you're doing uh, a whole bunch of, of, of translation that has a lot of similar content where certain phrases are being used again and again and again, you don't want those phrases in the translation to be varied as you go through. And so the machine will say, 
you, the last time you translated these four words as these four words, do you want to do that again? And you can just say yes or no. And, you know, it, it helps keep things consistent and it helps things go a lot faster because the translator has to physically type out fewer words. But it's not like, I mean, it's a computer thing, but it's not Google Translate at all. No. And uh, one other difference in the dynamic of hiring translators is that usually their work is less time sensitive. You can say, I need this in a week, I need this in a month, um, while an interpreter has to be there synchronously at the same time as the hearing or the trial or the meeting. So I believe that concludes our remarks. Here's some of our links and contact information. And I'm going to um, throw the... Stop the share. Yeah, I'll leave that up for a minute, but I'm going to welcome you now if you'd like to uh, put questions or comments in the chat or if you'd like to unmute yourself and and visit, we are at your disposal. But we also know that we've passed the three o'clock hour yes. or the, the one hour point. So thank and you. So if for you your... need to go, we really appreciate you coming and joining us. Um, and please feel free to be in touch if you have other questions, if there are ways that we can help other webinar ideas that you have that, that we that would be useful to you. This is this is a, a an idea that we believe in. Uh, we, we want people to have access to to a fair day in court. And we believe that language access is a huge part of that. And so um, just let us know how we can can help you guys out. I want to put you on I want I want to put you on speed dial. <laughs> Do it. There's a number. Do, do not give her our home phone number. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to thank y'all. Y'all are fabulous. And I, I think you. there should be mandatory training for language access coordinators, just like there's mandatory training for, you know, translators and interpreters, because we need to know what to do. We're here. I mean, I love my job, but I want to make sure that I'm doing the right thing and that I'm doing a good job. And things like this kind of help say, okay, yeah, you're on the wrong track or yeah, you're not doing that right at all. So that it's very, very helpful and informative. And I have to, I found out that I'm speaking next week at a judges conference and I'm like, okay, when do I get this PowerPoint? Cause I'm going to do this one and this one, this one that y'all did. Cause it's, it's really enlightening the way that y'all do it. So thank you. thank you. Yes. Thank Feel you. Feel free to steal all of our ideas. Oh, I will. Okay. Sure, <laughs> sure. And if you guys have good ideas for us, share them back. Yeah, yeah. We just like to share. Any other questions or comments or anything we can do to help y'all? No, we have to every question. Oh, we're good. You're amazing, <laughs> right here, my dude. Well, we don't know questions to ask yet. We're still on too new. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Fair enough. Fair enough. We're, All right. We're standing by then. Yeah. Texas 911 may help you. <laughs> do, do email us and let us know if there are, uh, you know, we'd be glad to do another webinar. So just let us know what, what, because we kind of covered everything today. We hit a lot of things. And if we can narrow it down a little and only work on smaller pieces of it, we could do that as well. Yeah.